Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today I'm pleased to have joining us uh, Kevin Carson, who's uh, Hello. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Stateless Society and holds their Carl Hess Chair in Social Theory. He's the author of Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, Organization Theory, a Libertarian Perspective, The Homebrew Industrial Revolution, The Low Overhead Manifesto, the Descartes Regulatory State, the, can't read me on writing, I can't read the subtitle. What's the subtitle of the Descartes Regulatory State? I don't know. I uh, changed it so many times before I actually, uh, it's the, see. It's, it's the, countervailing the, power, the countervailing power of individuals and networks. I think that's what I. Yeah, there you go. Scribbled on the sheet. Uh, you know, plus some, you know, plus some other works and I'll have links to all of those where you can either buy them or read them online uh yeah the big thing i'm working on now is uh my forthcoming book exodus uh and there's a wordpress site with the the manuscripts to date for that it's yeah. exodus 875.wordpress.com and that's also that's accessible from kevin a carson dot is it org or com or whatever? Anyway, I'll, I'll have the Yeah, link. Kevin A. Carson dot org. Uh, yeah, there's a link to it there. I'll have the and I'll have the link to it in my uh, in the description below the video. Yeah, um, you can you can get PDFs of uh, of uh, all my books from that site. So, mm -hmm. so it's you know, Kevin used to have a uh, a nice um, a nice site called mutualist dot org, but it got taken over by someone else, and some of his works are still on there, but have had ads interpolated into the text in a way that looks as though he wrote them, ads for like casino gambling or something. So mutualist.org is yeah. lost to us. I've still got the old uh, Lycos Trellis website with whatever its URL is, but uh, I don't own the mutualist.org domain name. And whoever bought the mutualist dot org domain name and has that instance of the site uh, has control over it that I have no say over I have no idea who they are and uh, the trellis version I've got uh, I can no longer log into or edit uh, pretty much all of their their editing software is just totally defunct it's just sort of uh, wreckage on the internet right now but you can read it yeah well yeah i've got you know, i've had some past sites that have you know, fallen prey to various sorts of problems as well well anyway so i want to start off by asking you, uh, you know, a bit about your background about growing up and then how you got interested in uh in anarchism and your uh, your political interests more generally. Okay, well, uh, I was uh, fairly uh, along in years when I started getting interested in anarchism. Uh, I was in my mid thirties uh, when I read uh, *Human Scale* by Kirkpatrick Sale and. It had a lot of uh, information that got me started on further investigation into economic and political decentralization. I followed up a lot of the sources in his footnotes and read uh, a lot more stuff on things like corporate subsidies, uh, economies, and diseconomies dis of scale, and so forth. And that got me more and more interested in all the ways that the state artificially promotes centralization and uh, shifts economies of scale upwards uh, and the ways in which the capitalist economy depends on state interventions of one kind or another for its survival. Uh, the, ways in which large organizations are suboptimal in terms of e efficiency and depend on state intervention, uh, 
ways in which the uh, incomes of the super rich and the profits of big business depend on state intervention. And at some point in that process, I started thinking of myself as uh, an anarchist and investigating a lot of different lines of uh, anarchist thought. Uh, what did your political outlook been before that? Uh, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, and starting, I guess, around 1990 and through the early 90s, I was uh, into uh, a lot of uh, different different strands of classical conservatism, uh, traditionalist conservatism. Uh, I think uh, uh, Russell Kirk got me started on that, and I uh, increasingly gravitated towards uh, decentralist, uh, agrarian, uh, distributist, and, and so forth. Uh, models of, of conservatism uh, with a fairly strong streak of economic populism, which I guess is what led me to Kirkpatrick sale in the first place. Uh, well, I used to be yeah. a hawkish Reaganite, so yeah, yeah, yeah. about the embarrassing past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it was pretty much a domino chain once I started uh, Moving leftward after reading Kirk Sale, uh, I uh, went went left pretty rapidly in economic terms, and uh, after that, I guess in the early uh, knots, I started uh, shifting leftward uh, on social issues and abandoning uh, my previous cringeworthy positions on a lot of those things, which I, I don't really even want to discuss. They're, they're so embarrassing, you know, in retrospect. But um, once I, I guess uh, it didn't take me long once I started investigating anarchism to hit on uh, Tuckerite individualism, uh, his theory of the four monopolies uh, and the dependence of, of uh, profit, interest, and rent on artificial property rights or artificial scarcities enforced by the state. And I considered myself an individualist anarchist or a uh, mutualist for quite a long period of time. Uh, and then more recently, I started shifting again towards uh, identifying more as an anarchist without adjectives uh, rather than specifically being a market anarchist. So what, uh, what was some of the thinking that began to move you in that direction of you know, less of a focus on market anarchism and more of the adjectiveless anarchism to use an adjective? Well, part of it is just, I guess, the way I see uh, the likely course of post-capitalist transition, not as being something driven primarily by converting a, a majority of the population to any particular doctrinaire ism, uh, you know, like getting everyone to uh, agree on the world socialist movement uh, model. Uh, you know, where everyone in the world uh, decides they agree on uh, the uh, WSM's capital S model of socialism, and it's implemented democratically everywhere at the same time, or, you know, Rothbard's libertarian law codes or whatever, I think the transition is actually going to be driven by the terminal crisis tendencies of capitalism, uh, the tendency of the old hierarchies uh, of the state and big business to disintegrate, uh, tendency of their various monopolies and artificial property rights to become unenforceable, and uh, their tendency towards 
fiscal exhaustion, in which case the various commons-based institutions and local economies and the social economy, direct production for use, and so forth, will be things that people turn to out of necessity, uh, where survival is, is the killer app of people. As unemployment and underemployment increase, people will turn out of necessity to alternative you know, forms of direct production for use and uh, creating new mutualist mechanisms for pooling income, uh, pooling risks and costs, uh, providing uh, a social safety net outside the state or employer-based systems and so on. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, the actual model it takes will just be uh, based on all of the the little seeds growing within the interstices of the the current system that people turn to out of necessity. It'll be primarily driven by practice and need rather than by ideology and the range of institutions people turn to will be pretty broad and vary widely from from one area to the other. Uh, so, you know, it, to, to uh, shorten it, um, I'm extremely skeptical of any monolithic model uh, of hyphenated anarchism, you know, whether it's based on uh, markets or uh, syndicates or whatever yeah because you see uh you know in the contemporary scene uh, on the one hand you've got like you know not just the ancaps though especially the ancaps but also you know a number of of more lefty individualist anarchists too though not as much who uh you know, for whom markets are the be all and end all and are very suspicious of anything that's commons based but among social anarchists it's the other way around they don't see any useful role. Many of them don't see any useful role for markets. Things that everything has to be commons, um, and uh, you know each one you know, is, is very confident that the preferred form of economic organization to the other is inherently oppressive. That uh, and yeah. kept people, any kind of commons has got to be oppressive. And social anarchists often think any kind of market is inherently oppressive and also unworkable. That uh, you know you, that there's no way of making those things work except in some sort of, you know, horrific way. Um, well, I, I see it as kind of a, an oranges to apples comparison because um, commons are primarily a uh, property model and markets are primarily a distribution model. And generally, property models are prior to markets, you can have markets coexisting with any number of of property models. And uh, the way I see it, commons will be the dominant property, uh, property model across the board, either uh, individual usufructory uh, property ownership uh, and usufructory uh, ownership by small groups, uh, you know, co-housing uh, projects or micro-villages or whatever, and uh, wider commons-based uh, ownership models of, of natural resources or, or land trusts or whatever. And given that uh, initial property system, markets are likely to be one of the expedients people resort to in distributing the outputs of these various uh, social organizations. I guess my primary uh, objection to the market anarchist label, you know, getting back to the, the whole, uh, you know, problem of monolithic organizations is that the word market itself, uh, carry strong connotations of the the cash nexus and for a long time when I, I called myself a 
market anarchist, I would put in the asterisk that, you know, being a market anarchist or believing in free markets doesn't mean you want the uh, cash nexus or market exchange to be a hegemonic social model. It can you know, coexist with the society where uh, a plurality or majority of production takes place outside the the money economy, uh, you know, in direct social production. But that just seemed to fall increasingly flat, even with me, because the very word market itself, mercado, uh, mercados, uh, uh, and its very roots uh, means uh, marketplace, a uh, place where people engage in money exchange. So referring to it as market anarchism had a lot of the same problems as referring to a market economy as capitalism, privileging one factor of production. I just uh, finally decided there were more drawbacks to the term than there were benefits. And I don't, you know, I don't reject planning, uh, horizontal planning outside the cash nexus out of of hand. I'm pretty agnostic on the, the feasibility of that versus, versus markets. Uh, but, you know, getting back to what you were, what set me off on this, <laughs> uh, the uh, people who totally reject markets versus the people who lionize them is, uh, I guess I take uh, Graber's position that I'm, uh, I'm open to anything uh, that that, uh, face-to-face groups of people decide to work out between themselves from a position of equality when there's no state and, uh, no armed enforcers at anyone's back imposing their will on anyone else. And I really can't see markets not being part of the mix in some places. Uh, What I really can't imagine is pretty much what Graber himself said he couldn't imagine. And that's uh, the majority of people in society recognizing someone else's decision to just uh, draw a line around uh, on a map and fence off an area that they claim for themselves uh, and demand that anyone who works that uh, piece of ground give them a portion of the product of their labor in return for the right to work it. I just don't see a Robinson Crusoe scenario working like that in any case where Robinson Crusoe is not the only person on the island with a gun. I think people will just uh, ignore the absentee property titles, uh, knock the fences down, and, and start planting turnips like the diggers did. So a lot of uh, of your work has been driven by sort of uh, examining uh, the history of capitalism, if that's the term for it, and uh, and um, talking about you know sort of um, the uh, you know, the ways in which what's often presented as presented you know by both its friends and by its enemies as the natural evolution of, of, uh, you know, of free markets and so forth. Um, it, you know, it was actually, uh, you know, the product of, uh, you know, systematic force and expropriation. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, oddly enough, saw someone on, uh, Facebook not long ago, uh, a right libertarian, saying they didn't see how socialism or uh, a communist or non-market society could exist without a state preventing people from having 
private property and they seem to be operating from that same assumption that uh, our current model of private individual property that's uh, fee simple, uh, alienable, uh, commodity form of property that can can be with titles that can be sold on the market and so forth is just some naturally arising uh, phenomenon like the the Robinson odd scenarios in Locke or Adam Smith or or whoever that you know at some mythical point in the past uh, people just peacefully appropriated their various hand uh, homesteads by occupying the ground and mixing their their labor with the the soil when in actual fact it's it's uh, the predominant model throughout history has been that what right libertarians think of as the natural property model the individual fee simple private property is the thing that's always been established only by the state and it's always relied on states actively nullifying and suppressing pre-existing non-state property models that have tended to be collective or communal along the the lines of the uh, medieval open field system in Western Europe or the the mirror in in Russia uh, or what Marx called uh, kind of problematically, I suppose, the Asiatic mode of production uh, that that Warren Hastings suppressed in India, uh, the system in Israel, where the the clan or tribe or village had uh, some sort of uh, eminent property in the land. Uh, with you know land that had been mortgaged or sold or whatever, or ultimately reverting back to that collective entity pre- periodically. Uh, but that that seemed that kind of collective village model seems to have been the predominant model that uh, spontaneously arose in most parts of the world uh, at the time of the agricultural revolution and predominated everywhere in the world until fairly recently. Yeah, can you see a little bit about, uh, you know, the book you're working on now, uh, Exodus? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Exodus and uh, subtitle is General Idea of the Revolution in the 21st Century, which is uh, sort of a play on Proudhon. It's uh overall theme is on the shift from the uh, post-capitalist transition models favored by traditionally by the old left that were based based on centralized hierarchical organizations uh, coordinating the overthrow of capitalism and on transition models that involved either Uh, seizure of the state through parliamentary politics by a labor or socialist party or uh, violent overthrow of the state and seizure of the means of production by the organized working class, you know, whether it's a Leninist vanguard party or by uh, a federation of syndicates seizing industrial control and in every case they were they were mass based uh, they saw a more or less disruptive eruptural transition model and their transition was based primarily on the seizure of commanding heights institutions of one kind or another where it be, whether it be like the where state I am now, <laughs> I'm sorry like where I am now virtually yeah, yeah. Uh, I so, see. Yeah, if you can get a uh, get a uh, syndicalist uh, group going to take over Auburn University, uh, you know, more power to you. But uh, 
you know, I'm arguing that uh, there's been increasingly a, a transition to a an interstitial or prefigurative model, and I think uh, I think I got the the word uh, exodus as a label for it from uh, Negri and Hart's uh, Empire trilogy. Uh, can't really remember, but. Uh, the idea is that with new technologies uh, that make commons-based production and social organization more feasible and more efficient, and uh, it becomes more feasible to create a new society in the interstices of the present the present one uh, outside the dominant state and corporate institutions uh, and to gradually, uh, I think uh, John Holloway called it uh, making cracks in the system and then linking those cracks up with each other. Uh, And that's a model that's been promoted by a lot of anarchists. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, Colin Ward is the leading figure that that comes to mind, uh, linking up all of these different counter institutions. And yeah, I uh, think he talks about. He, I think maybe he borrows this image from Paul Goodman. He talks about uh, you know, spheres of freedom gradually, you know, build up within the existing society and gradually expanding and linking up with each other. Um, yeah, uh, and it, it was it was. Uh, Eric Olin Wright, uh, in uh, envisioning real utopias, uh, el- elaborated a lot on uh, interstitial transition models. Uh, but Wright was uh, an open Marxist, um, open Marxist, which, among a lot of other things, differed from. Orthodox Marxism and not seeing any uh, definite or strongly likely crisis tendencies in capitalism that could be counted on to bring it to an end. So his approach was almost entirely voluntaristic in terms of saying, you know, let's build these interstitial things uh, and try to replace the current system okay yeah um, he uh, Eric Olin Wright uh, said you know there we shouldn't count on uh, capitalism having any preordained uh, end or being a system with an end as well as a, a beginning you know we should be uh, promoting interstitial development of post-capitalism on the assumption that the system could survive forever if we don't do anything to change that. So I I think what I'm adding is uh, some of the more uh, traditional leftist assumptions about crisis tendencies of, of capitalism and how those will intersect with interstitial development to promote it and to create room for it. And not everyone who calls himself a Marxist seems best understood as a Marxist. I mean, I think of William Morris, who thought of himself as a Marxist and very anti-anarchist, but, but you know, the feeling I always get from reading him is, is almost always much more anarchist than Marxist. Um, but on, the, you know, on these, you know, these images of spheres, uh, cracks, and so forth, there's an image I like to use, it's sort of borrowed from Gustav Landauer's idea that the, you know, the state is a way of interacting and we abolish it by interacting differently, uh, acting differently toward each other. The way I think of it is uh, sort of, you know, in a more, act, a more active image than, than spheres or cracks is to think of, you know, you've got a, you know, a massive room where everyone's dancing one kind of dance. Um, and then you just start some people dancing a different kind of dance, often maybe off in the corners. Um, and then gradually they, they lure more and more people into dancing that dance instead of the dance that everyone else is dancing. And then they start 
hooking up until gradually enough people are dancing the new kind of dance that you know the people who want to dance the old kind of dance can you know can go off in the corners and do whatever they want but they're no longer dominating the the story yeah uh, i see a lot of uh vulgar marxist types and you know i'm not limiting that specifically to marxist leninists uh necessarily but people who uh, really stress historical materialism as a as a uh, theory of history who say um, who attach a lot of importance to the distinction between reform and revolution and say that uh, there can be no um, meaningful changes or shifts uh, in a post-capitalist direction under capitalism, quote unquote, with the assumption being that capitalism is some sort of all or nothing essence and that you're either under capitalism or you're outside of capitalism um, with uh, no transitional point in between the, you know, the idea, uh, you know, uh, that Engels himself uh, and, and, and the vulgar Marxists discussed of the transition from the transformation of uh, quantity and equality, where there's a long series of incremental changes within an existing system uh, that shift its character in a certain direction until it finally reaches a critical mass and hits a, a systemic tipping point. It's uh, something that, he, that they themselves seem to be ruling out. You know, it, uh, I'm, I'm stepping into your bailiwick here just based on my uh, readings of Copleston and a, a few other other things but in you know in terms of medieval philosophy they seem to be taking a realist uh, position on uh, the significance of the word capitalism where it's uh, some kind of a, uh, an Aristotelian um, idea uh, that you know the system either uh, displays or, or, or does does not display and to me it, the the very distinction between reform and revolution is meaningless would you would you say that uh, feudalism uh, transitioned into capitalism through reform or through revolution what does it e even mean to ask a thing like that uh, yeah and when I, I, teach, I think when I teach a history of philosophy and I talk about things like transition from the ancient period to the medieval period and then to the Renaissance and so forth. They say, well, you know, good luck finding the date where say the middle ages ended and the Renaissance started, you know, whatever it is you think is distinctive about the Renaissance, you can find the seeds of it running back at least to, you know, the year 1000, whatever you think is, is distinctive about the middle ages, you know, it's still, a lot of it's still hanging on in the 16th century. Likewise, with the beginning of the medieval period, you know, you've got, um, you know, you know, the Western Empire fell in 476 AD, uh, we say. Well, you wouldn't have noticed anything falling if you'd been there <laughs> uh, on that, you know, the year. It was sort of a long, gradual slide. And the same thing with the fall of the Eastern Empire. I mean, Constantinople fell all at once, but, um, uh, but the... But by the time it fell, the Byzantine Empire had basically shrunk to just being Constantinople and some surrounding areas. And likewise with intellectual movements like, you know, the Enlightenment and so forth. I mean, they're useful categories, but it's, but you can't really, you know, you can't really put too much faith in, you know, precise, you know, precise boundaries of time where suddenly, suddenly everything changed and people suddenly started thinking and acting differently. And in a lot of these cases of these, you know, whether intellectual movements or political movements or whatever, 
you know, the people who are doing something differently are just a subset of all the people and the other people are doing other stuff. Like, like, you know, during the scientific revolution, there were still lots and lots of people, you know, pursuing, you know, Aristotelian scholastic science and some were doing it well and some were doing it badly, but that was all still going on. And, um, uh, you know, in every era, you know, you know, just there aren't that many sharp transitions. Yeah, and, and there were uh, people still intellectually living in the uh, ancient or, or classical model for centuries after uh, who didn't see it as a, a fundamental break. Uh, uh, Justinian, you know, attempting to revive the Western Roman Empire or as, as late as uh, uh, the Carolingian uh renaissance uh you know uh, being uh you know very much a you know self-perceived as a as a continuation of the uh, ancient and, and classical model uh, and you know to take a, a less vulgar marxist framework uh, the idea that uh, any particular system uh, is a number of coexisting uh, formations. Uh, the the Middle e Middle Ages at any given time were uh, included uh, coexistence of some surviving uh, uh, social formations from the ancient slave economy uh, and uh, nascent inst uh, formations of the future capitalist system developing in the interstices of it and, and so on, uh, as, as William Gibson put it, uh, the future is already here. It's not uh, distributed evenly. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't really mean anything to, you know, to call something a capitalist institution and say that because it's capitalist, it, it can't be, socialist or take on a socialist character uh you know again the the intellectual tools are there uh and marx himself if these people would would pick them up the uh, dialectical approach of seeing a part as defined by its functional role in relation to the larger system it's it's embedded in uh you know you look at the uh medieval guilds uh and there might there you know there might have been a, a guild in uh medieval paris or aachen uh in the 13th century that still had the same still had the same name, still had the same charter, uh, coat of arms and regalia and so forth in the 16th century, uh, but would have been a fundamentally different institution. I, I quoted uh, somewhere, I, uh, it may have been in um, desktop regulatory state, uh, an extended passage from Andrew Robinson, a uh, professor in the UK who described the long-term transition process between a uh, hierarchy-based system and a network-based system, where he argued that a lot of institutions of corporation and state uh, might retain nominal institutional uh, continuity from one period to the other and yet uh, undergo uh, fundamental change in their actual characteristics with the the corporations that managed to successfully negotiate the transition becoming more network-like uh, employee controlled and cooperative and uh, the state institutions taking on a more platform like or, or partner state character. 
Yeah, we just look at so, anything from, you know, from the Democratic and Republican parties to the English monarchy. Uh, you know, we've got things where the, you know, the names have remained the same, but the way they actually function has, be, has been radically transformed and what they're all about is quite different. Yeah, yeah so I mean, monarchy, yeah, the, it's not really about anything interesting anymore. <laughs> It used to be about interesting bad stuff. Now it's not about anything interesting at all. <laughs> well, there are still a lot of uh, uh, theoretical constitutional powers the British monarch has that uh, someone might uh, actually try to be, uh, you know, might actually try to exercise. My my guess is that if they did try to exercise them, they would be. Uh, Put under a regency, and as the, as the British put it, in a half no time. But it would be interesting. Yeah, no, I suspect it too. Uh, yeah, the the time for a I suspect that the time for a monarch to try and reclaim uh, those powers has has passed. There was a time when they might have gotten away with it, but um, now and enough time has passed for people accustomed to thinking of them of them as as figureheads where. They're, you know, they're giving their, you know, their formal permission for legislation and so forth is regarded as so pro forma that if they actually started withholding permission uh, for legislation, I think they soon found out that they were, you know, they were drawing on a on an empty bank account. But it would it would certainly be interesting to watch. It would make, you know, it would make the monarchy interesting again, <laughs> briefly. In yeah, I think it would have to be such a disruptive or uh, chaotic. Well, you can imagine that they would, uh, where if if the if what they were doing was representative, if if what the monarch was trying to do was representative of some popular movement opposing what the legislature was doing, that could give them a kind yeah. Of it it would have to be almost you know a transitional period where the uh, monarchy became uh, the nucleus around which uh, the new social organization crystallized or something, but. You know, I mean, well, it would be unlikely just, uh, to, revert, to revert to what the English monarchy used to be. No, Even but you know, what's the old? What it was as a saying: history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Napoleon crowning himself, and was it eighteen oh one? Crowning himself, Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, anyway, uh, but you know, just I guess my overall point is that. Uh, the really vulgar Marxists who say that there can't be uh, any kind of post-capitalist transition under capitalism, quote unquote, or yeah, they're 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 mistaking uh, words for things, and they're mistaking the map for the territory. Uh, so, uh, anything else that you're working on in 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 the book Exodus? Is there uh, anything else you're working on other than just you know just the um, this idea of, of uh, you know the contrast between sort of the old leftist you know cadre party discipline uh, radical transition stuff? Um, well, the first uh, six chapters. And it's it's sort of uh, reached the unwieldy state where chapters six and seven were so long that I had to break them down into parts one, two, and three, like I did with some of the chapters in uh, desktop regulatory state. Uh, but the first six chapters are, you know, mainly concerned with contrasting the uh, new Exodus-based model with the old left model in terms of uh, a number of different qualities like interstitial development, gradual transition, a shift away from workerism or laborism, uh, a shift from mass and hierarchy to horizontal organization and so forth. And then chapter, and I've just about finished those aside from some polishing up and 
the main thing I'm working on now is ch uh, chapter seven, which is so far been broken up into three parts uh, that just describing in detail the various building blocks of uh, post-capitalist society that I see uh, springing up in the interstices of uh, current capitalist society. Uh, it's heavily, it's heavy on uh, commons-based uh, local counter institutions like land trusts, uh, alternative currencies, uh, you know, municipal broadband, uh, uh, participatory, uh, participatory government on the partner state model and so forth, and on larger political movements like uh, the, the new municipalist projects uh, in Barcelona or Cooperation Jackson or the the Cleveland uh, Evergreen model and so on. And I, I hope to have it done by the end of this year. Look forward to it. You're looking and, around, you know, but, sorry, go on. And, you know, as I, I said, uh, the, the current manuscripts to date are at Exodus 875.wordpress.com or you can find uh, Find it linked from my Kevin A. Carson org website as well. So looking around at the the world situation today, if you can bear to what uh, you know, what signs of of uh, of hope or promise do you see against all the rather nasty stuff that's going on? Well, I guess my main source of hope, besides uh, all the unprecedented levels of resistance I thought I never thought I would uh, see in the near term, uh, I mean, people burning a uh, uh, police uh, police station uh, uh, precinct uh, headquarters to the ground in Minneapolis, and a majority of the public supporting them, or uh, the, the just the levels of resistance in the streets all over the country with Black Lives Matter, uh, people blocking courts to stop evictions, uh, actually, you know, showing up at apartments to block landlords uh, from hmm. evicting people. Uh, you know, that's that's obviously one source of hope. But I I think more than anything, it's just how incredibly fluid uh, things are, how many different black swan events are intersecting at the same time uh, as much of a threat of authoritarianism as there is from Trump, you know, with things like, you know, threatening to delay the election, threatening to send federal troops into uh, Democratic cities and possibly disrupt the election, uh, uh, sabotaging the mail and and that sort of thing. It's such an incredibly fluid situation. I really just can't imagine anything he did like that, even if he went all out having any staying power, because I think the situation would continue to be as fluid afterwards. Uh, as it is now, uh, if he even many of his supporters were a bit turned off by the talk about delaying the elections that has creeped out a lot of Republicans. Yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever, uh, you know, even if he wanted to go uh, full Reichstag enabling act, I think his house would be built on sand. If the man overplays his hand, I think. Uh, he stands an excellent chance of uh, best case scenario for him uh, going the route of the Shah and worst case uh, going the route of uh, Ceausescu or Mus Mussolini. 
And in the meantime, we've got all of these uh, interstitial developments that are just growing like wildfire, wildfire that I think do have staying power. He's he, Trump is one of those uh, monsters that's uh, appearing in the process of transition because the transition isn't complete, you know, to uh, bastardize a quote from uh, Gramsci, but uh, I think there are so many more ace cards up the sleeve of the su successor system while the old one is exhausting uh, the last expedience it's got. We've got so many, many, sorry, sorry, go on. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, if, if there's some really uh, serious disruption to the election or whatever, just given the unprecedented scale we've already seen of people staying in the streets, you know, even if the press is paying less attention to it since uh, the end of May, uh, I think we would see uh, an order of magnitude increase uh, in the people out in the streets just absolutely shutting shut down. I, I think uh, it would uh, quite plausibly uh, spur uh, nationwide rent strike, debt strike, uh, uh, possibly a uh, you know, general strike of uh, a lot of key transport workers uh, I think you know it, it would be it would be a more than once in a century level of uh, radicalization and disruption and I don't think uh, anything resembling the old system could survive it of course we have you know we have this um, sort of duplicated all around the world we've got you know uh, nationalist leaders uh, coming to the fore in in countries that were you know initial, that were before them less less so um, uh, that are uh, you know from India to Turkey and so forth with varying degrees of support versus resistance um, like Modi in India seems to be having a lot of support. Uh, Erdogan in Turkey, the the support seems to be gradually waning, particularly with the rising uh, generation. Um, but uh, you know, it's hard to predict how things are going to go in any of those places. Yeah, I think there's a good chance that, um, and I you know I hope this isn't uh, appropriate of or, or anything, but. Uh, Figures like uh, Trump and, and uh, Johnson and, and Bolsonaro and so forth are uh, the uh, ghost shirt, uh, ghost dance of the old system. Uh, it's last, it's last hurrah. It's uh, you know in the United States, Trump and his hardcore supporters represent people who see themselves in radical demographic decline. Their whole agenda is framed around taking America back because they know there's no way they can survive without just uh, resorting to authoritarian politics, gerrymandering, vote suppression, and so forth. And even then, I think they see themselves in rather defeatist terms of you know, eat me last, uh, postponing uh, the transition until after they're gone. Well, and I've been teaching in Alabama for 20 years, and although Alabama remains a solidly uh, red state, I've noticed shift in attitudes in my students over the last 20 years, um, both social and economic attitudes, uh, away from you know, sort of the hard right-wing lines that uh, I used to encounter at the, you know, at the beginning of that period. So there's definitely a shift going on in the younger generation. Yeah, and Texas and Georgia are both very close to uh, a tipping point in terms of party uh, identification. They might have already reached it if it weren't for 
gerrymandering, and I'm I'm not an electoralist in the sense of uh, seeing electoral politics as the primary driver of change or. Uh, and Biden is not the, the most firing opponent of Trump we could imagine either. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> true. But I, I I guess I think Sam Smith of Progressive Review said the uh, the point of. Uh, Electoral politics is not for fighting the war. It's for creating the least bad battlefield to fight on in the future. And I, uh, that's, you know, one, one way in which I disagree from a lot of the accelerationist types who think, uh, you know, lesser evilism or Compromise will in some in some way give uh, life to the old system or uh, detract from revolution or or whatever. I don't see electoral politics as a, the way of achieving the revolution or achieving systemic transition in the first place. I see it as uh, a way of uh, sort of desperately f throwing forces into the breach in order to buy time for to buy time and space for all the important things so yeah if we can uh, do something to head off the worst of the fascist assault right now uh even through some sort of really you know god-awful uh centrist dnc democratic president i mean uh that's Basically, all I can hope for is creating a somewhat more benign background environment and, and staving off the threat of actual fascism. Uh, the real, the real work to be done is outside the state, but it'll be a lot easier without a fascist in the White House. Or without so much of a fascist, anyway. Yeah. Well, I. <laughs> I guess a uh, bureaucratic Caesarist instead of a uh, fascist. So switching gears for a bit, uh, what are some of the, uh, uh, what are some works of art or literature or music or movies that you found particularly inspiring or engaging? Well, I uh, recently reread, uh, well, not recently, last year I reread um, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. I guess you could actually call it recently because reading all three of those books takes one hell of a long time. Uh, and then I just read uh, New York 2140 for the first time. And I. I really, uh, you know, find new things to appreciate in the Mars trilogy every time I reread it because um, I think uh, his post-revolutionary Martian society in the second and third uh, volumes is probably the closest fictional scenario I've seen to a partner state model. Um, the Martian planetor planetary government is really more a support platform for the network of self-governing local communities than it is a uh, Westphalian state in the classical sense. Uh, there are a handful of just fundamental constitutional rules that are more uh, organizational precepts for the society, you know, in terms of its basic uh, property rules operating system uh, than anything. The uh, idea that land is a social commons that can't be permanently alienated to individual ownership and that uh, Residual, residual claimancy of the firm is automatically in the hands of its labor force and that, uh, you know, larger conglomerate f firms are to be formed by a federation of uh, self-governing 
cooperatives and that sort of thing and the planetary government is uh, primarily just consists of a standing judiciary to enforce these laws against uh, legal claims that they've by injured parties that they've been violated and to enforce the uh, rights of the planet against uh, pollution or excessive extraction in the environmental courts. Uh, but for the most part, it's just a uh, horizontal network of horizontal communes that's got a small standing governance body to keep things uh, running pretty much you know who was it that a event who was it that originally came up with the phrase uh, uh, administration of things rather than legislation over human beings at saint simon I, I think it was saint simon yeah yeah uh, and then that got I, both both by the sort of the augustin thierry line and uh thinkers and the marxist line of thinkers um <clears throat> and uh Oppenheimer for that matter. But yeah, uh what did you think of, of New York really, 2140? Uh it it, does, it seemed a little bit less less decentralist. Uh It is uh, it's 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 more uh I guess uh, more of a Bernie Krat <laughs> Bernie Krat book, but it was still, you know, it had some uh, real hell yeah moments in there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, at the climax of the book, uh, the submerged parts of, of lower Manhattan, you know, the uh, neo-Venetian uh, part, of, part of the island with, you know, people living in skyscrapers and uh, taking ferries between them and uh, living on floating platforms and all that, uh, a lot of them were rendered homeless by a super hurricane that forced hundreds of thousands of of people to uh, move in mass northward, uh, initially, you know, settling in refugee camps in uh, Central Park. And uh, after a couple of weeks of, the, of uh, that, when they finally just got fed up uh, with living in those camps they marched into uh upper manhattan uh you know into the areas where they had the uh thousand story uh luxury residential towers that were almost entirely empty and just you know owned by billionaires around the world as a real estate investment uh, they attempted to move into these vacant towers and the the uh Mercenary uh, security firms hired by these absentee billionaires fired onto the crowds of people trying to move into the towers, and this was captured on video uh, by uh, the host of a, a popular uh, program in the in the cloud that was watched by billions of people, and she she showed the uh, empty the towers standing empty while people lived out in the weather uh, showed the uh, security firm firms firing with live ammo on the crowds and she said uh, that's enough we've had it with this shit you know i'm calling a rent strike now uh, wherever you live you join the the tenants uh, union you go on uh, strike now you don't pay rent you don't pay your mortgage payment you don't make payments on your debt or on your student loan whatever it stops now we bring this system down we crash the stock market and uh you know you contact your rep representative and uh and say this time around you better not pull a pulse and this time your bailout had better be a buyout and uh, you turn these banks into you know cooperatives under popular control you uh redistribute the land you cancel the debt uh you know all the graver stuff uh, and, uh, uh from every peasant insurrection in history uh and that you know that's when i said yeah hell yeah i was i was uh, really like that
Gary Chartier and I met him and had coffee with him a few years back. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think you gave him a. He spoke at the. I forget. Apparently, he spoke at um, an anarchist book fair. And I can't remember. It was somewhere in California. I can't remember whether it was San Francisco or where it was. Uh, and William Gillis was there, and they got into a debate about the uh, about the the merits of markets, and uh, so. Uh, I forget who came up with the idea, whether it was William or, or Gary, came up with the idea of giving him a, a copy of Markets Not Capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember that. And then we thought, well, instead of just mailing it to him, although I managed to, I managed to track down uh, <clears throat> both his uh, email address and his mailing address online, which were, which was not easy, but I, I did it, which probably might be disturbing to him, I don't know. But anyway, uh, we thought, well, why, you know, why not, um, and this was probably Gary's idea, why not uh, meet with him in person? And so we, we met uh, over, over coffee, coffee, the unifying theme of this, of this show, um, one of the unifying themes. Uh, we met in uh, Davis, uh, where he lives at a local coffee house, and chatted a bit and we gave him a copy of Markets Not Capitalism, which I don't think persuaded him of anything, but anyway, we uh, gave it to him. He gave us copies of, uh, signed copies of Galileo's Dream, which was, I think the book that he had uh, a bunch of excess copies of lying around um, at the time. Uh, but anyway, that was uh, enjoyable. And, and by this point, I've read almost all of his uh, works. Um, many of which hook up in in odd ways with the Mars trilogy. Like they're not all strictly in continuity with it. They're like slightly different branching timelines. Yeah. But they're- 2312 uh, is not quite the same universe, but it's uh, very similar. Yeah, uh, so I think you know, a lot of those, um, a lot of those, uh, a lot of his works are you know, and the Martians, which is a book of short stories based on Mars, some of them are in continuity mm -hmm. with the Mars trilogy, and some aren't. Some of them involve the the people from the first Mars book never actually getting to Mars. <laughs> uh, we we see them, uh, but, but the whole project is declared a failure, and they never go. Um, and he does that with some of his other works too. For example, you know, uh, he, one of his earliest works was this uh, Three Californias trilogy. Um, yeah, I, I, I need to read that. Yeah, so there's there's one version of it that is, you know, sort of a, a hyper capitalistic uh, future. There's one version that's sort of post apocalyptic, and then there's one version that's sort of, uh, you know, his ideal utopian future. Although it's a, you know, it's a restrained utopia. It's not a you know, it's not a utopia where everything works perfectly. It's a utopia. It's a matter of sort of constant struggle uh, against uh, you know, forces that want to undermine it. And also certainly not the kind of utopia where everyone is happy in their personal lives. Um, uh, and they're, you know, but they're, but um, they're sort of links among the three, uh, the three books and uh, uh, that was enjoyable. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it sounds kind of like uh... Ken, all of Ken McLeod's uh, fall revolutionary, uh, fall revolution books where uh, some of the uh, sequels are alternate yeah, history. Yeah, yeah like the last, the last book, the, the Sky Road seems to be, uh, it seems to follow a different uh, timeline from, uh, it was a good, good, like the first three books seem like they could be all one consistent timeline. But then the fourth book, so it seems like it's, and when he's confirmed, McLeod has confirmed that it's a, a different timeline. It's an interesting question trying to figure out exactly what the point is. If there is just one point, and there might not be just one point, but figuring out exactly where and why it uh, diverges. And McLeod is also and, someone and who's, yeah, who's, uh, you know, written interestingly about <clears throat> sort of uh, political and economic possibilities out, outside the usual um, uh, you know, usual frameworks and he's got you know and he's 
in, in his books, he's got, um, uh, <clears throat> he's got um, anarcho-communists and uh, anarcho-capitalists and various intermediate things and so forth. Um, and and, the eyes of Calvinists. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, none of the systems is, is perfect, but, you know, a lot of them work more or less. Um, you know, it's, it's not the kind of book where say, welcome to our utopia. Here's where everything works perfectly now. And then everyone's happy. It's not that, not that kind of book. Um, and, uh, a lot of really horrible puns like, uh, my stars, it's full of gods. <laughs> and uh, nearly every be, page has some kind of in joke or reference or something. And all the chapter titles of his books, or almost all the chapter titles, are some kind of in joke or reference to something in science fiction or philosophy or politics or something. <clears throat> or the uh, the uh, old old guy uh, talking about particle physics who says. Uh, it, it were all fields when I were allowed. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's a nice line. Yeah, Ro Robinson must have really, tracking down his email must have been pretty hard. Uh, I remember hearing him on uh, the Marooned on Mars podcast saying he just wasn't uh, an internet person. Uh, generally, you know, whatever online contact he had was through indirectly through some staff member. I think uh, Neil Stevenson is uh, pretty much that way also. He's almost, uh, has almost no internet presence. I, uh, and Kirkpatrick Sale about his only presence online is whatever uh, followers of his have, you know, posted, uh, have keyed in or scanned some of his work and posted it. Well, I managed to track down Kirkpatrick Sale at at one point, uh, let me see if I'm right in remembering. Uh, <clears throat> I think he's, yes, he's one of the, he's on the uh, advisory board of the uh, Molinari Review. Um, mm -hmm. I have a massive uh, advisory board. I wanted to get you know, a fairly broad range of of people for that so that you know anyone who's who was thinking of publishing in our pages you could look at it and find you know someone they wouldn't find too alienating <laughs> even, even if even if they wouldn't like a lot of the people on there they'd find someone they think oh well if they're if they're on the editorial board then this can't be too too awful <clears throat> anyway so does I've he have uh, pardon oh, does it does he have uh some kind of reactionary or uh, eco-fascist leanings. I remembered he uh, he did a really long review article on the Unifomer manifesto a long time ago. Well, if if he does, I didn't know about it when I asked him <laughs> to be on the board, but um, um, but I don't know. There are so many so many layers among those different uh, factions. It's hard to. Hard to tell. Uh, well, have you read uh, The Years of Rice and Salt? Yes. That's a, that was a really great one. That's, That's Robinson. Great. Uh, one of the better alternate histories, especially uh, the the whole arc of uh, of the guy in uh, Baghdad that was sort of uh, Galileo and Kepler and Newton all rolled into one. As you know, as one is, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, you know, for our viewers, the the basic plot of that book is: what if the Black Plague had had uh, wiped out not just a third of <clears throat> of Western European population, but closer to nine tenths, uh, which means that Western Europe would not have dominated the world in coming centuries. And so, what might the world have looked like uh, otherwise? Um, you know, what, you know, so exploring, exploring the ways in which different cultures, uh, dominate in its stead for good or for ill. I mean, the, the moral is not 
how great things would be and, or how terrible things would be if, if things had gone this way. It's just interesting ways in which things would have been better or, or worse or just different. I uh, remember reading someone who speculated that the, you know, the primary at the time when uh, Western European and Islamic and the Chinese civilizations were the, the three main contenders, the main reason uh, the Islamic civilization wasn't the first to uh, circum, uh, circumnavigate uh, Africa and uh, reach the Americas and, and so forth uh, and unify the world commercially was uh, the effect that the Mongol conquest had on South Asia, uh, you know, until, until uh, Persia and Mesopotamia fell to the Mongols, uh, Islamic civilization was the most uh, liberal and, and forward thinking on earth. And uh, it became much more inward looking and backward looking just as a result of the trauma of the Mongol conquest. Uh, and that cleared up space for uh, Europe to come to the head of the line. And I think if you look at, uh, that's pretty plausible if you look at uh, what Russia was after it uh, fell to the Tatars uh, compared to what uh, Kiev and Rus was like before. I think, as a matter of fact, I think uh, wasn't Kiev and Rus one of the uh, examples uh, Eisler pointed to as a sort of semi-cooperator uh, civilization? I'm not sure. But yeah, just uh, that kind of brutal conquest uh, makes a, a huge difference. And, you know, it gets back, I guess, to uh, authoritarian political styles uh, in general. They're much more likely to come about in periods of perceived scarcity or in hospitable environments or whatever. Uh, people are more or apt to turn to authoritarianism and see everything in the world as a, a zero-sum game where you either beat or are beaten. Yeah, I've also read that one of the reasons that Western Europe ended up taking uh, an increasingly hostile attitude toward the Muslims and Jews in their midst uh, was again connected with the Black Plague, um, which of course the Muslims and Jews bore no responsibility for, but it created a kind of, of uh, you know, heightened paranoia. Um, oh, and for that matter, the, um, you know, it's often said, you know, when people talk about, you know, why Socrates was executed when Athens had tolerated him for you know, such a long time. He lived a you know, he lived a, a very long life, and you know they, they'd had they'd had the plague, then they had the conquest by Sparta. They were kind of demoralized. There's a temptation to look for a scapegoat uh, at that point, and uh, so that may be why they. You know, it's it's then that suddenly Socrates becomes a problematic figure that needs to be addressed by force of law when prior to that he was just you know, whether they liked him or disliked him they no one seemed to have thought that there was anything that should be brought before a law court yeah with the uh, anti-semitism in western europe uh, that seems to be a common pattern uh, not only with jews but everywhere in the world that there is some sort of an ethnic diaspora uh living intermixed with a larger surrounding population, uh, you know, that are engaged disproportionately in, in commercial pursuits. Uh, you know, 
know, people take that conspiratorial attitude to, to some extent towards South Asians and East and South Africa, towards uh, the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia and so on. When Germany lost the First World War, a lot of people decided to blame the Jews of all people, uh, who <laughs> were not obviously the ones most most directly responsible for the for the loss, but you know, got to blame someone, and that part of the dynamic that helped to bring the Nazis uh, to power is this idea that that oh, we would have won the war if we hadn't been stabbed in the back by the Jews. And if you know, if anyone had in 1900 had been trying to predict uh, where in Western Europe there would be an anti a virulently anti-Semitic government, it probably would have been in France. Yeah, no, uh, France has a long history of anti-Semitism, even though it doesn't, it hasn't had as exciting a history of anti-Semitism as Germany, um, but certainly a long one. You know, and of course, anti-Muslim as well. Yeah, I, I guess the uh, anti-Muslim thing is uh, a lot more recent. Well, just since the uh, Berlin Conference or uh, whatever, and the influx of uh, you know former uh, colonial subjects in, in Northwest Africa. Yeah, well, the uh, the French they go and conquer Algeria and. And they complain that people from Algeria are, uh, are coming to, to France. Well, uh, and uh, and uh, I mean, I like yeah, I've got a lot of room to say this is an American, but uh, France just has a really horrible history as a decolonizing country. You know, with with uh, Haiti uh, paying indemnities for over a century. After independence, if anyone should be, and, should be paying indemnities, it should be the other way around. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and you know, uh, Algeria and all of the the uh, former West African countries are, uh, you know, part of the condition of independence was uh, joining a uh, trade organization under French control. Uh, I don't know if it was that or if it was. Uh, indemnities for uh, various colonial debts or or what but i mean they've they've been paying the equivalent of hundreds of billions of of dollars to france ever since like the 1950s and 1960s and we look at uh, how wealthy france is and how you know how impoverished these other countries are the idea that they're sending you know, these massive payments uh to france uh, you know, as compensation for, you know, not being ruled by France anymore. It's, it's really, you know, pretty repellent. I think it kind of uh, gives the lie to uh, that quip from uh, Deirdre McCloskey that, that robbing poor people isn't a good profit model. <laughs> yeah, if, if you can rob enough of them. <laughs> yeah. And, well, I mean, that's the I uh, that's the study uh, I just finished for C4SS. That's one reason I've been so obsessed lately about uh, uh, capitalist nursery fables and Robinson odds and, and just so stories about the origin of private property and the origin of specie currency and so forth. As, as I wrote a. Uh, paper on that I that I submitted just a couple of weeks ago and uh, her argument was that um, primitive accumulation uh, either you know via colonialism or enclosure was not the dominant uh, reason for Western Europe's uh, increase in wealth uh, which to me the, the, that whole question is Beside the the point, uh, it's very much the reason uh, uh, for the imbalance in who the wealth was distributed to, uh, and it's it's it may be true that uh, stealing uh, from poor people is not a good uh, 
business model in the short term for actually accruing wealth, it's extremely effective in creating future social structures and differentials of power that can be used for extracting wealth. I mean, uh, the landed classes in, uh, may or may not have gotten a lot richer in 1750 from uh, enclosing the common pasture, but the role that played in creating the wage system and uh, creating a propertyless proletariat had one hell of an effect on uh, the profit model of in industrial capitalism 50 years later. Yeah, it wasn't so much the value of the land that they grabbed as the value of the, the workers they displaced. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, it was a lot more valuable to the workers they displaced than it was to the uh, capitalist farmers who took it over. Um, they, you know, I was I remember reading in Neeson where she described uh, just in incredible detail uh, the richness and variety and independence of the social model it enabled. Uh, among the land poor and landless peasantry, you know, it was one of those, uh, one of the best examples of how uh, marginalized populations have the economic incentive to make much more efficient use of the limited resources they they have and to extract maximum value from them. Uh, whereas uh, the dominant classes take over these resources and just uh, treat them, uh, treat land and capital as an almost unlimited resource that they can create growth by throwing at whatever problem they want to solve. And you wind up with, with uh, farmers who own thousands of acres getting paid by the government to hold it out of use or uh, capitalists with more investment capital they, than they can find profitable outlets for uh, that buy up uh, government bonds with a guaranteed return of a few percent a year, or people that own, uh, own land that just uh, hold it out of use that uh, someone else could actually be living on and, and supporting themselves but it's not worth it to them because, uh, you know, the person settling on it couldn't uh, pay a rent to the landlord in addition to supporting themselves. So it just doesn't get used. That's, that's the really the growth model capitalism has pursued since the beginning is extensive addition of resource inputs, treating energy or uh, enclosed uh, colonial minerals or whatever as uh, essentially free goods. And then you wind up with the, the counter economy. Uh, uh, Vinay Gu uh, have you ever read The Unplugged by Vinay Gupta? I have not. Okay, it's a uh, it's a uh, a little short story set in the future where uh, the uh, working class people start just opting out and seceding from the mainstream economy by taking advantage of the hyper efficiency of new op open source technologies, uh, unplugging. Uh, he the phrase he used was buying out at the top. That uh, you know using modular prefab housing technology, uh, ultra-efficient water harvesting and recycling technology, uh, open source uh, uh, alternative energy and uh, micromanufacturing and so forth, you could uh, buy into a counter economy uh, to obtain your share of subsistence resources with the equivalent of uh, you know, three months factory wages. And there were tens of millions of people that had unplugged from 
mainstream society doing that uh, and it's it's um, it's just you know it's a classic example of the the uh, technical technical innovations that marginalized populations come up with because they don't have unlimited amounts of land and capital to to throw at problems so they actually have to uh, ah that, that's what I was thinking of the Fremen in Dune I mean they they came up with something like a still suit because they had to and we we've got a counter economy based on extracting the most uh, efficient use from physical resources while sharing ideas and techniques as efficiently as possible without intellectual property uh, toll gates set up to make people pay tribute uh, for cooperating or, or using each other's ideas. So we're, you know, we're growing up as a uh, junkyard dog economy that just uh, running circles around the old corporate dinosaurs. Well, on that note, I think we're uh, probably running short of the amount of uh, processing time I want to uh, uh, do for these videos uh, since, since my system is pretty slow. But this has been a really uh, enjoyable conversation. Any final thoughts? Can't think of anything. I've rambled uh, on about just about everything that popped into my head, but I well, really was, had a good time. Idea. That was pretty much the idea of these interviews are supposed to be like. They're not, you know. Well, I appreciate you inviting me on here. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming on. Cool. How long do you think it'll be uh, before this is uh, up online? Um, it'll be within the week anyway. Cool. All right. So thanks a lot and uh, farewell. All right. Uh, take care, Roderick. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.